Uh, okay, well, as the email indicated, we will allow you to begin with the first three minutes, and uh, our timekeeper is right across the table there, and uh, give you the clues. But for the three minutes, uh, you're welcome to fill us in on the questions we did not ask. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to kind of stay with my notes, because if I don't, I'll run out of time. So, okay. my, my time, tell me when my time starts. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, I'm Linda Ellis, and I'm running for the State Board of Education, District 8, and I, I'm sure there are no questions about it. I rather, I prefer waiting until the question session, so I don't use my time explaining the State Board if there's somebody who has questions about that. But I'm a native Texan. I grew up in the Volga community in Houston County, outside of Love Lady, Texas. My parents were uh, graduates of Texas public schools. My, my family actually moved to that area in 1856, soon after this first public education system was established in Texas. Uh, and um, my, my parents were farmers, uh, cotton farmers. I chopped cotton and picked cotton as myself as a child, and I went to all 12 years at Love Lady ISD, graduated with 22 in my graduating class. And, um, and I, uh, my parents, though, taught me the value of education and faith and family and hard work and persistence and integrity and all of those values, those, uh, those values that uh, I still hold today. Um, I graduated from La Buddy ISD and Texas Public Universities. I have four children who graduated from Texas Public Schools and Universities. I have 14 grandchildren. Eleven of those are currently in Texas Public Schools and, and three will soon join them. So I have a vested interest in helping our public schools get better. And, um, and that's one reason I'm running as you'll find out. I'm, I'm a strong proponent of public schools, and that's, of course, the position I'll hold on the State Board of Education. However, I respect the rights of parents to educate their children wherever they please, whether that be private schools or home schools or parochial schools or charter schools or, or public schools. It is, it, is your, it is your right as a parent. And, I would always fight for that right. Um, I've been an educator in Texas for 28 years uh, with combined experience as a classroom teacher, a university professor, a district program director, and a consultant working primarily in low performing schools throughout the state. Um, and I have 25 years of experience working uh, with professional organizations at the local, state, and national level. What I learned from all of these experiences is the power of individualizing instruction for children the power of reaching and teaching each child. And had we received the support from Austin 17 years ago to continue that, um, I would not have had a need to run for public office. Or, uh, but what I saw happening 17 years ago as is happening today is that politicians have usurped the powers of the local school districts and taken a lot of those powers onto themselves at the state and now the federal level. And so uh, when I became a governmental relations chair 17 years ago for the professional organizations representing children and literacy educators in the state, I started going to Austin providing testimony, attempting to have an input, and that testimony fell on deaf ears. And that's when I, um, that's, that's when I became involved, and I've been involved ever since. Three years ago is when I decided to run. I probably interviewed with some of you three years ago when I ran as a write-in candidate. And I'm back on the ballot this time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, who has the first question? Well, that's a question if nobody else has one. Okay, Ken. Are you familiar with an organization called C-Scope? I am familiar with a curriculum called C-Scope, right? Okay, are you familiar with the fact that they are now teaching Islam in uh, Texas uh, schools? They just started at Marlin Independent School District and would not allow parents in or anybody to monitor the course and, and it was not a comparative religion course because they were not teaching any of the other religions. I'll leave the rest back to you. Thank you. I've had lots of questions about CSCO. Okay. I am not a proponent of CSCO. I do not like the curriculum. Uh, I, it's, a, it's a program, a curriculum written by the region centers because you probably know that the regional educational centers in Texas are now kind of self-supporting. And so they wrote that program um, collaboratively to make money. Uh, and I know I know there are reasons for keeping it private because it's a money making. You know, if they released it, they wouldn't be able to make money off of it. However, I do not believe that there should be anything taught in schools that parents do not have access to. I've also called the head office in Austin to try to get a meeting. I'm going to Austin uh, Wednesday. I'm hoping to be able to meet. Um, 
I, I don't know uh, what their curriculum looks like. I've been in schools where they use the curriculum. I, I don't know uh, the details of what's in the curriculum. I have a copy of it. I'll be glad to email oh, okay. it to you. Oh, okay. I would love to see it. Right. I would Absolutely. I would love to see it. And it, so I agree with you. I mean, I'm not pro-Islamic bias, and I'm not pro any curriculum where parents don't have input. That's why one thing I propose is the more the local control, and I don't mean local, just districts. I mean to the parent and the child level. I think the closer we get instruction to that child, where the parent and the teacher can work together, the better. So, what do you see the role of the uh, state board of education? Well, there are three. There are three um, committees on the state board. One is curriculum and the curriculum committee, and that they set the standards. Uh, and of course, they uh, adopt textbooks. And then there's the permanent school fund committee that oversee the permanent school fund uh, finance committee. And then there's the the school initiatives committee that oversees the adoption of charter schools in the state. All of that's kind of changed over the years. So when the state board was first initiated, we didn't have state standards. We didn't have state tests. And so the roles have kind of shifted. And I think we have a real problem now, and this is what the problem I've seen, is that we have people who uh, get into those positions and they take too much of that power into themselves. I don't think it's the role of a member on that state board to write curriculum. Um, so uh, you, but you're, you're applauding what happened with the, uh, at the end of the last session when they, took, they basically emasculated the uh, State Board of Education's uh, power to, uh, to write textbooks and uh, to authorize textbooks and, I, I and just, any supervisory yeah. uh, role at all over, the, over what happens in the Texas schools. They can still, um, the State Board can still uh, recommend textbooks. They have a recommended list. It's up to your local districts as to whether they purchase off of that recommended list or if they make their own decisions. To me, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a community member, that's what I would want. I wouldn't want somebody in Austin, Texas or Washington, D.C. writing curriculum for me and for my child. I would want to have input there myself. And so, to me, the more local we can get that, if you can sit down, if you, you elect your school board members and you uh, have a say in whether that person gets reelected or not, first of all, you go to that child's teacher. If you have a problem with C-scope, you go to the child's teacher. And I don't know where this has happened if that parents didn't get access to that, but if they go to the parent's teacher and that doesn't work, then you go to the principal, then you go to the superintendent, you go to the school board. If that doesn't work, you get rid of your school board member. And so to me, local control is always best, rather than somebody in Austin uh, having that control. You know, right now the Republicans control the State Board of Education, which is a good thing. But what if that weren't the case anymore? And we had people on that board writing curriculum for us and, and you know, choosing textbooks, and we don't agree with what they're, the decisions they're making. So, anyway. So you talk about local control, but how do you get local control when state is dumping millions of dollars into these school districts every year? I mean, the, if you if the state gives money, they're going to control the money they get. You agree or disagree? Well, I agree that now there's going to be accountability. I mean, I don't know that I agree with that. No, my question because, is, how yes. do you have the local control when you have centralized money? They don't go hand in. They don't go hand in hand. They're they're opposite. Um, you mean? Are you talking about before, like Senate Bill Six, where the state controlled the money for the textbooks out of the permanent school fund, but now that money goes to the local district? Um, I, I think still you have. I mean, I'm going back to the days when I started teaching in 1983. I taught in Lovelady, Texas. We had total control of. The problem, I think, is more with the federal money coming in than, than the state money. Because as a teacher, I felt totally in control of what I did in my classroom. Okay, so you're, you're comfortable with state to... control, is not federal control. What's that? So you just said you're, you're comfortable with state control, not federal control. Are you talking about, I'm not comfortable with the state controlling what I do in the classroom or controlling what the local district does, okay. but overseeing the funds, overseeing, now we have standards, overseeing standards, overseeing um, 
uh, textbooks, the textbook adoption, because that's what they're elected for. It was never a requirement for state board members to be educators. They, they are, are, they're supposed to oversee, and we're supposed to have Texas essential knowledge and skills. That means just the essential standards. But these have become volumes, and it is controlled. I mean, kids can't even read and write anymore if they follow that state curriculum. It is so uh, isolated with, you know, um, with, uh, with just uh, isolated skills. There's no time for real reading and writing anymore. I am totally opposed to federal control. I would, I would do away with the Department of Education if I could do that because I've seen nothing but damage come through federal dollars that have come into our schools. And I'm a consultant now in low-performing schools that are low-performing because of their NYP scores, which is the federal, the federal scores. And, you know, by 2014, every school in this state will be in trouble with the federal government. And we're, look, we're very close to having a national curriculum, and I am totally opposed to that, and I will okay. fight it okay. forever. <laughs> okay, who else has a question? Would you mind defining more precisely what you mean by isolated controls? Isolated <coughs> control? You, what you just said. Isolated skills, or no? And you said that they were they were doing the children a disservice because of all this isolated control. Oh, because of the control of the curriculum. Yes, I'd like you to define that a little bit more fully. Okay. Um, well, because the state standards are supposed to be, you know, as I said, and when I started teaching, we had no state standards. Uh, we were in charge of our own classrooms. The state standards are supposed to be very minimal. It's what children should know and be able to do when they finish a course. And they've become too thick. They've become more like curriculum guides. So they're volumes now. And so if a teacher follows that curriculum, I call it curriculum, not standards, there is no real time left for actual reading and writing. And I'm a literacy person, so my background is, you know, is reading and writing. And Language arts is what I spent my 28 years helping instructing readers and writers. And then do you want to so see great damage speed and done. accuracy and memorization and things like that, that that are really valuable to education? Memorization? Memorization in math. Oh, definitely, yes. Kids have to memorize the multiplication tables. Right, there is a and lot of memorization. Speed and accuracy and, and legible handwriting. Yes, yes, yes. And I don't think that's ever been, it's always been in the, I know, you know, my opponent says she had to work hard to get grammar and phonics and spelling and handwriting back into the curriculum. It's never been gone. I mean, it's always been there. The, the issue was the way the language arts curriculum was handled. It was taken from the teachers and sent to Washington, D.C. You know, they hired, this, they hired standards work from Washington, D.C. with Sue Pimentel to facilitate that process, and they're the ones writing the national curriculum. There was a huge problem with the loss of any, um, sorry, there's a huge problem with the loss of any um, local control, any, uh, any input from the 20,000 teachers that spoke up in the state. And um, that's what the language arts community objected to. It wasn't the grammar and phonics and spelling and handwriting. It was that the voice was gone. It was dismissed. So, yes, I support all of those things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you that very was much. so short. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for taking the time to come in. Thank I know you. that was a big commitment on your part, so appreciate we appreciate it. it. Appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.